We also have a baptismal service this morning after the service with Eliza Nelson going to be getting baptized. Certainly excited about that. The water, I got it as cold as I possibly could. Threw some ice cubes in there last night and a big old ice cube in there this morning. And uh, actually, it's like bath water in there right now. It is really nice. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to start there in the very first verse and down through verse number 12. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, said unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. He gave the standard. They say unto him, Why did Moses then to give a written, then command to give a written of divorcement and to put her away? Again, we looked at that last week, talk more about that. Moses never commanded that. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, and then here's Christ's standard he gives right now. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except, uh, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save, save to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, that were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there, are, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you. Lord, I do ask your blessing upon the message today, Lord. I pray that you work in hearts and lives, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, please, I pray your word would have free course, that we would see the truth that is here in your word, that it would strengthen us, that it would help us, Lord. Please, Lord, I beg you that you would work. Again, Father, I love you, and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, this is the part three of already a two-part message. I'll do a little bit of review of the other messages to lay the foundation for what we're coming to there from verse 10 and 12, which is the disciples' response to what Christ had just taught them. As you can tell, they were shocked by His words. Uh, and again, as we went through this, we start off with the very first week. Um, we, we dealt with how controversial this subject is, and it is, especially after last week, um, with all the different viewpoints and questions that were coming. And uh, um, but there's, there's, you know, it's it's an area, as I mentioned, affects all of us. All of us have somebody close to us or have been through it. There's people right in this room who have been through it, have been through divorce. Many of us have parents that have went through divorce, children that have went through divorce, siblings that have went through divorce. There's not, a, there's not a person in here who has not been affected by the issue of divorce. And because of that, that is what, what stems from all the different views we have. We all want to be right with God. We all want to serve God. And somehow we want to justify what's happening in the lives of those we love or in our own lives to, to try and reconcile that together. And, and, it's, and you can always see those who hold a different position. Those who have, have been far from divorce and have never held it, it doesn't touch them at all. They have, they have one view. To those who have been through it, they'll, they'll throw out another view. Everybody trying to come at it from an angle that, that fits almost where they're at. The key is simply knowing what the Bible says. We've had different questions come in, especially after last, last Sunday's message, even on, even on YouTube and whatnot. And, and I, I might take a Sunday night service and answer some of those. There are answers to them. I mean, I think the Bible, again, I think the issue is not a matter where the Bible is not clear. It's not a bunch of ambiguity that's in the Word of God, why it's not clear. It is there. It's just sometimes how we want to see it. All right? The Bible does teach on the issue. And so when Christ, when, when remember the setting that's there, Christ has finished his Galilean ministry. He is literally on the way to the cross. This is at the end. We're near the end of the three years when this takes place. He crosses over to the east side of the Jordan River. He's in Perea now. And, and that's an important. That, that's where Herod is. That's where he's at. And that's where the Pharisees choose now to address the issue of divorce with him. They hit him with it. 
Again, they're not looking for a truth here. They were tempting him. They, they want him discredited or destroyed. That was the purpose of the question when he entered into that region. Because remember, it is that very region where John the Baptist lost his head over the issue of marriage and divorce. When he challenged Herod on his illegitimate marriage that he had going on and preached against it, it led to his arrest and eventually his head being removed. So the Pharisees hit Christ with the same issue, knowing he's going to agree with John the Baptist on his stance on divorce and remarriage. But Christ doesn't, you know, Christ is God in the flesh here. Christ, what he does is he almost mocks them by his first statement, the Pharisees, who pride themselves on the word of God. And it's always dangerous when you start priding yourself on the word of God because then you begin to lose illumination from God. And he said, have you not read? And that statement hurt them right there. What, do you not read the Bible? Have you not read what it actually says on the issue? And he gave them the standard that was given in the Garden of Eden. What he was giving was four reasons why marriage should be permanent. He let them know God made them male and female. He was dealing there with the issue of it's simply Adam and Eve. There was no one else for Adam. There was no one else for Eve. That was it. And many times if we will look at it with our spouses, that that's it. There is no one else. You will work out your differences. And he went on. Not only was it the idea that there was an Adam and Eve, he continued. He said, for, uh, um, for, this, uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. We dealt with the issue of cleaving in the first message and what that, and what that meant. And, and that, that, that welding, that gluing that, that is to take place through the pursuing of each other and what that produces in the marriage. That, that, that it, should, it should lead to that uh, not wanting to separate. And then we went into the third issue there that he said, And they twain shall be one flesh. And God said, because when you're married, you're one flesh. That's why it should not end. And then fourthly, we dealt with it, what God had put together, let, let not man put asunder. We dealt with the idea that marriage is the institution that takes place is something created of God. We should not destroy anything that is created of God. And I remember quoting from the one, one uh, commentator, I don't remember who it was right now. He, said, he had said that divorce is to marriage what abortion is to pregnancy. It's destroying something that God created. <clears throat> And so we looked at that there in the first week. And again, I, when I got into this, I was trying to, trying to study this from a blank slate because of all the different viewpoints on it. Just trying to, trying to come into it and look it up through the Bible and see what we're looking at. Try to understand Christ's words uh, that he was teaching there. Because when the Pharisees heard what Christ said, they responded with Deuteronomy 24. Which again, in my office, I've gotten Deuteronomy 24 a lot. They respond to Deuteronomy 24 where Moses does not command anybody to get divorced in there. The really, the only major command you see in there is about who not to remarry. But he does suffer them. You can see where the divorce was allowed and it was because of the hardness of their hearts. And so he put guidelines on it. He said, listen, there's no more of this. It, it was taking place. There was no denying that. Moses can't pretend that divorce isn't happening. And remember, when Deuteronomy 24 is there, the law's already been given. This is after the law. And so Deuteronomy 24 comes up. He knows that divorce is taking place. And the problem was it was polluting the land with adultery. Because they would divorce for what was not scriptural, of course, because God wasn't for divorce. They would re remarry somebody else, not even realize that in God's sight they're committing adultery. So the land was becoming full of adultery. So Moses comes up and says, listen. Here's, here's how this is going to work. From now on, because all they had to do then was just proclaim, I'm divorced. He so said, you're going to give her a writ of divorcement. This is going to some legal means now. There's going to be paperwork involved. That was even a delay to hope for reconciliation between the two, because, again, they were divorcing for any reason. And, and the, so the Pharisees are referring back to that, because the Pharisees, there were two viewpoints in Christ's day, very similar to our day. There were two dominant teachings within Judaism at the time of Christ. One by a, 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 um, one of their uh, scholars, uh, rabbis, Hillel, who taught you could divorce about any reason. Really, it was, it was crazy. If you didn't like the way she cooked, it, I mean, he had a list of reasons why you could divorce. And the only thing he had to do was proclaim you're divorced. And the Pharisees followed that position. 
The other position was by another fellow. He had died by the time that Christ was there. He probably died right before Christ's ministry got started. But his teaching was still there. It wasn't the popular view by any means, but it was well known. And that was divorce is never right except when adultery and fornication is involved. And that was the only reason. And so... And so they're trying to get Christ to be discredited, knowing that he would, he would, trying to, trying to change his popularity, or even to get him destroyed by, by uh, trying to, hoping maybe he would preach against Herod right there. But that didn't take place. So they bring up Deuteronomy 24 as somehow justifying, justifying marriage. And Christ lets him know, one, you're not understanding what Moses was doing. He said, yeah, he was dealing with a, with a tough issue of his day because of the hardness of hearts. It was taking place. Marriages were being destroyed. It was, it was causing sin in the land. And so he came down to mitigate all the damage that was taking place with the reality that he lived in. And he said, this is how we're going to do this. He said, uh, and, and he gave the list of, of, of this impurity or this uncleanness that you would find. And trying that, tying that into, in relation to the law of some, uh, of what the sexual immorality that was taking place. Many of them not going to the full point of adultery because what was the penalty of adultery? It was death. The law had just been given. And so once, once the Pharisees have brought up Deuteronomy 24, that's when Christ gave his standard. And it's, it's, it is in agreement with, from the Bible from beginning to end. And that is, he said this. He said in verse 8, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. God is, God is never for divorce. Malachi makes it clear. He hates divorce. But then he gives an exception in verse 9. He says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So here's, here's what Christ lets him know. He says, he says, here it is. Anybody who has basically got divorced and remarried, except it be for the cause of fornication, that that was adultery in God's eyes. That is true. There's no changing that. And then we also have to define, which is what I tried to do last week, what did he mean by fornication? And we tried to limit it to, we got comments on that, that it's just specifically dealing with like an issue with the Joseph and Mary and the betrothal period. I know exactly what takes place in the betrothal period. There is no way you can take that word and simply apply it to that standard. It wasn't what he was, it doesn't flow with the, it doesn't flow with the word of God. He was dealing with it, as I demonstrated last week, with the use of the word fornication of sexual immorality, which includes adultery. How that Christ had made it clear. Now, don't come here. The Bible does not teach, does not teach that adultery is a reason to go ahead and get divorced. God is always for reconciliation. He is. We can see that in the life of Hosea. Where God wanted the reconciliation there. It was, it was a picture of him and his relationship to the nation of Israel. And then you're dealing with the hardness of hearts. Which I'm going to focus on here in a minute. Where there's an unrepentant spouse when it comes like to the sin of adultery. That will not stop. And there's a hard heart there that won't repent. You can see, accept it before fornication. That's what it's teaching. And remember, we laid out the case as to why, because we see it, we see it even with the Lord in Jeremiah. We're in Jeremiah chapter 3, he says, because of adultery, because of fornication, that he has given Israel a writ of divorcement. Because of the same sin that he mentioned here. And then we try to apply it. Then why the exception? Why is that one? If that person remarries in Matthew 19 here, that person is not committing adultery. Because we have a Bible standard which is true. If, if the living spouse is still married, it's adultery. That's true. Romans chapter 7, other places. So why, why the exception given there? 
Again, we know the standard in the law was when people were caught in adultery, the punishment was death. When that occurred, when that was enforced, the other spouse would be free to remarry. Why? The spouse is dead. But in all of the Word of God, we never see that law carried out, enforced, the penalty of it. We don't have one example of it in the Word of God. Yet we have example after example of adultery taking place. We see it in the common ones, like in the life of David. We see it with, with Solomon. We see it with a woman who was taken in adultery, taken right before Christ. And they say, all right, let, let's, let's go and enact the law. Does he do it? He doesn't. He said, go and sin no more. He showed mercy and grace, which we all should be thankful for. But last week, as I made the case, putting it all together as to why the exception is given there is because, because God chooses to show mercy and grace to the offended, to, to the one who, or, or excuse me, to the offender who had committed the sin. Showing mercy and grace. And let's say it is, the, it is that unrepentant one. It is the hardness of hearts, which I'm going to dive into here in just a second. And then how cruel that would be to the spouse who did not sin. And telling them you can never remarry. When if the law was carried out, the standard that God gave, that spouse would be free to remarry. Because the other spouse would have been executed. There would have been death. And so, I, I, and so making the case that because God chose to show mercy and grace to the offender, he is not going to choose then to put torture on the other one. Well, I believe he, the exception given, well, I believe he looks at it as if the law was carried out for that person. Now, when the disciples hear this, they are shocked. The, the viewpoint of marriage and divorce that they grew up with was really so far away of the standard given to us in the book of Genesis. It was so twisted, it was so corrupted, and so very wrong. So when they heard Christ say, if you get married, the only exception given is that of fornication, of sexual immorality that takes place in the marriage. If, 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 you, if you divorce and you get remarried, you are committing adultery. They're, they're stunned. And they give a statement, they say, if that is true, they've been with Christ three years now. If that is true, then it is best not to get married at all. That's how they looked at it. I mean, in their mind, they, they could just divorce for anything. The concept of a commitment to one wife permanent to them, they were stunned. They were taken back. And then Christ responds in our verses, trying to be a help to the disciples, trying to get them to change, change their viewpoint. <clears throat> now again, the Bible does not teach that a couple should divorce over anything. An exception is given in Matthew 19 that is consistent without the word of God, even where the Lord did. And by, remember, the Lord never gave a writ of divorcement to Israel for 700 years they were committing adultery. It was, still, it was still looking for reconciliation, reconciliation, and reconciliation, and reconciliation. <clears throat> so, today we're going to look at this. At the, at the disciples' response and Christ's teaching to them. We're going to see, one, what leads to divorce, the greatness of marriage, and the eunuchs that Christ is dealing with here. So the first thing I want to cover here, though, is what we have given to us within the first 12 verses of what leads to divorce, which, again, the Lord hates. If I was to ask here right now what leads to divorce, we would get many answers. Some would say things like adultery, poor communication, not meeting needs, growing apart, bitterness, etc., etc. There would be multitudes of reasons. But the reality is it really comes down to what Christ gave. 
hardness of hearts. Hardness of hearts. That leads to it. Again, as I've already mentioned, this could apply to a spouse who is in sin, who is in committing adultery, but has a hard heart and refuses to repent. They don't want to stop. They have a hard heart towards that. And again, I think this is the exception that we're even being dealt with here in Matthew chapter 19, where, where there is a prolonged, unrepentant adultery taking place. This also has the idea, of, though, of hardness of hearts where one spouse will not forgive, where forgiveness is not part of the marriage, where there's hardness of heart. When you will not forgive your spouse, divorce is not far away. Hearts were certainly hard in Moses' time, as Christ said, just like they were in Christ's time and just like they are in our time. And that led to, that was the reason Christ gave for divorce being so common, hardness of hearts. The fact is, we're, we are all sinners, and all, for all of us who are married, you're married to a sinful person. Forgiveness is going to be essential for that relationship to work. There's great danger when a hard heart begins to take place in a marriage. Because what happens when the heart hardens? You're dealing either one with somebody who's unrepentant in it, is just getting away from God and unrepentant in it. And that going to be leading to the divorce or the other side where there is a, a repentant heart, but the other offended spouse just can't forgive. So what begins to take place? Well, the first thing that's going to come up with that when that is in the marriage is going to be anger in the marriage. Anger will fester. Usually when you find somebody who struggles with anger, you find somebody who struggles with the idea of forgiveness. Again, many times wives and children have to put up with an angry husband or dad. Anger will eat at you. Anger changes even how you view life. There's warning after warning throughout Scripture and the dangers of anger and the dangers of anger controlling you and filling you up. If anger isn't dealt with, that leads to the next stage. And that is bitterness. When bitterness comes into the marriage... Oh, it's a dangerous place to be now. Again, the anger, if not dealt with, when there's sin, when there's sin in the marriage and there's hard hearts that are involved, bitterness is not far away. Again, when the anger isn't dealt with, you open yourself up to the great sin, the great problem of bitterness. It's a poison. Bitterness is a horrible place to live. Bitterness will want to occupy all of your time and all of your thoughts. Anger just comes and goes in stages, but bitterness stays. All of a sudden, you begin to get bitter against your spouse. It now almost consumes you. It's no longer, you don't want to be in the same room. There's this, the, the, the relationship is, is being destroyed moment by moment. The bond is broken. The cleaving is no longer there. Divorce is close. The Bible talks about that much where bitterness will trouble you and defile you in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. When bitterness is present, the heart does something else now. When problems and different things come up, whether they're small or big, instead of seeking for reconciliation, you begin to seek for, for revenge now. When hurt comes up, you just want to hurt back. That's, that's how the marriage begins to operate. It's vengeance that you seek now because your bitterness has taken over. You have done and you have broken that relationship with the spouse, whether you're still in the same house or not. You no longer seek what is in the best interest of your spouse. You seek to hurt back. Forgiveness is not in control. Anger and vengeance being controlled by bitterness is. <clears throat> you can remember a great example that we have on this. I taught on the, uh, preached on the idea of forgiveness, I don't know, a year or two ago. 
in the life of Joseph. And remember, when, when, when Joseph was revealed to his brothers that sold him, they wanted to kill him, they sell him instead of killing him, and, and all of a sudden, we go through the whole story, and God has put him in a prominent position, second in command in all of Egypt, the world empire at the time, and, and all of a sudden, his brothers realize it's Joseph, and they're before him. They're absolutely paranoid. They, they thought for certain he's going to take vengeance. He was in power. He could have them all executed. Just a word and they'd all be dead. And, and they're always trying to scheme a way to try and convince Joseph. But Joseph understood. He said, listen, I, I have forgiven you. That's what was controlling. It wasn't vengeance. He had forgiveness because he understood the God that he served. He understood that God was in control. He wasn't seeking vengeance. And again, remember, had he been seeking vengeance, had he not had forgiveness with all that he went through in his life, he never would have found God's will for his life. He would have destroyed it. An unforgiving spirit will destroy the will of God for your life. An unforgiving spirit will destroy your marriage. Again, you become more worried about restitution instead of restoring. You want vengeance. They hurt, you hurt. That's what you want to do. But remember, vengeance belongs to God. And again, if those aren't dealt with, divorce takes place. Some marriages at times can virtually live in divorce and even though they're married. The relationship has been severed so much. But again, the Lord told him, he was very clear. He said, our problem here is, with all that was going on, he put it down in one category. It is because of the hardness of hearts. And I believe, I don't have time to develop that, the time is going fast, but I believe we could connect that directly to the fall of man. Remember in the garden. It was almost, a, 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 I mean, Adam was created first. We see his headship there already uh, um, by him being created first. And then Eve, she was the come along, the, the, uh, help meet for him. But then after the fall, it's interesting. Because it's in the fall that you see the curse that's even on marriage. It's in the fall when the Lord tells Eve, because she had come out and assumed a leadership position, if you will, over Adam. It wasn't co-anything when she took of the fruit. The Lord had said, your husband shall rule over you, and your desire shall be to him. It's that very part of the fall that leads to the hardness of hearts and the fighting that takes place within marriage. Man has always tried to fight against the, the, the curse that's given there. You see, the only, only other time we have that same statement is with Cain, where the Lord talked about sin lying at the door. The, the desire to the husband isn't dealing nothing with a physical desire for the husband. That's absurd. That's not a curse. It's a blessing of marriage. It's dealing with what is taking place where he had just said, he shall rule over thee. We can see that element of the curse from the very beginning, uh, from, from almost any culture you go into, where that element of the curse taking place throughout the world. And, 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 then, and then the wife, where it, where it was, it, when you see it in Cain, I believe you can, see the, you can see the interpretation of that, of the control of the wife then trying to seek the control back and the conflict that that leads to. <clears throat> forgiveness will be key. We all have to understand that we are sinful people and cannot have right relationships without forgiveness, especially in your marriage. Again, you want to see your relationship transform, practice forgiveness. The fact is we all need forgiveness, so don't be a hypocrite. Again, we can think of the example that we just, we just went through here in Matthew where you had the, the fellow who was forgiven that amazing amount of debt. I mean, I, it, was, it was such a large amount. We're talking an enormous, enormous sum of money. Huge. Something he could never, ever repay, and he simply forgives it all. The Lord forgives it all, and then he goes right out. He goes to a guy who owes him, I can't remember, was it a month's worth of wages, and refuses to forgive him and has him thrown in debtor's prison. And we see how the Lord handled that. 
So the disciples, though, let's get back to the disciples now in this. The disciples, upon hearing this standard, we can see how they viewed marriage wrong. They actually said, and they weren't playing a game with it. If, if that's true, if I have to stay with that person except to be for fornication, it's better not to marry. Think of that. Think of what they're saying. They did not understand the greatness of marriage. They didn't see this as one of the best relationships that God has given. They had a wrong view of marriage. They're like, I, I don't want to commit to marriage if it's for a lifetime. Do we have any other culture that holds that view today? Yeah. The fact is the Bible teaches marriage is a great thing. It's the person that you share your life with. The Bible says, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. Proverbs 18, 22. It says a prudent wife is from the Lord. Marriage is the very first institution given by God. He gave it for man's completeness, for his enjoyment. I mean, think of all that God went through just to be able to present Eve to Adam and try and get Adam to appreciate all that he had in this relationship that he was giving him. It shouldn't be ever approached as somebody afraid to get married because of a commitment that's going to be there. It should be the desire for it, of trying to find that whose God's will is for your life and saying, listen, this is the person that I want to share my life with. It should be something to look forward to, not at all to back away from. Marriage is one of the greatest things in life, but because of their culture, they didn't recognize that. Again, they should have been thinking, I can't wait to find God's will for my life, to find a spouse to, to spend every moment with of my life. But that wasn't what they were doing. So Christ tells him, he basically goes on to let him know here, you have no idea what you're saying that is good not to marry. He lets him know what he's going to tell him. Is basically, you don't have the strength to follow through with that. He said, you don't. You don't have the strength to follow through with that. And he gives example. He tells them, let's read now. They said in verse 10, In the case of the man, be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were sore born. Now, let, let me put this context here. We're going to tie in that statement with verse uh, down, with, down with when he finishes there in the verse. You know, He's dealing with, of course, his teaching and what the disciples just said, that it's good not to marry. He said, all men can't receive that. You're asking for something to go against the way you're designed. And then he tells them, the men who can receive that are in three groups. And that's it. They're in three groups. He says, and notice the wording again. All men cannot receive the same, save to the whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, and he gives three categories, which were so born from their mother's womb. That's number one. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, number two. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So he tells them, they think they're going to be able to say, okay, well, it's good not to marry. That's not the answer. He goes, you, you guys can't, you, you don't know even what you're saying. You can't receive that. He said, there's only three that have the grace and strength not to get married. And the first group was those who were, who were born that way. I'm going to read from Phillips here because for some reason, which really I don't understand at all why, why there's any debate about, about what, what this is at all. I'm going to read from Phillips. <clears throat> Phillips anyhow called this group based that, that their ability not to get married and remain single was based on constitution. He said some people are so constituted physically, emotionally, and psychologically as to be naturally celibate. The opposite sex does not attract them. This can also deal with anything from in addition to physical deformity or for those, uh, again, who don't find the opposite sex attractive, no desire for it. There are some that, 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 that don't have the desire. There are some with a tiny percentage who have some physical deformity where that's going to take place. Marriage isn't a possibility for them. That physical relationship is just not possible. There's also those who simply don't have the desire for it. 
it's not present. The word does not always mean, as we're going to see, in all the categories given. Some people think it, it has to mean to the idea of castration. It's included in there, but no, there's many definitions of it, including the other two, which only really the second one and only part of that second one of the group would include that. So there are some, as he says, physically, emotionally, and psychologically, physiologically, as to be naturally celibate. The desire is not there. He said, that group, they, they would have the strength. That group, they could follow through with what you're saying. He said, there's a second group as well. The second group are eunuchs of men. This could mean those who, who, who due to whatever circumstance they found themselves in, were castrated. Or even those based on some commitment to men or government or work had chose to remain unmarried and, 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 and different things that went with that to remain celibate. He said, thirdly, is the, as another group, those who themselves make themselves eunuchs out of dedication to God, they say, listen, we're not going to get married uh, for the kingdom of heaven's sake, that there's a grace and strength. They're being, in other words, it's they're being led of God to this. It's of the Lord, and they decide they are not going to marry, that they are going to remain celibate. He said, those are the categories given for those, uh, for those eunuchs, which means those who are not going to get married. And so Christ puts it like this. He's letting them know, you, you, you can't even receive what you're saying. You were designed for marriage. That desire is going to be there. So he's, again, what he's trying to get them to do is to understand that what you, they've got to see the greatness of marriage and not fear at all the standard that he's giving. And Christ finishes with these words, He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And again, much of that, there, there is some room there for trying to figure out where is he going with that. I, I, and and I've, I've settled on one. There's different viewpoints of it. I have no doubt he's dealing with all of his teaching, dealing from, from what he said in Genesis, what he said about Genesis in verse uh, 4 and 5 to his teaching there coming down in, in verse 9. And he's tying it together. And that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Christ understood without a doubt, just like he had to deal with in Moses' day, just like it's still being true in our day, that people are going to divorce and remarry. He's not justifying it by any means. He was already clear that when it not, doesn't meet a biblical standard, it is adultery. And yet he knew it was still going to take place. And I believe those who are able to receive it there are simply talking, well, not, not just simply. I, I know we're part of that group. I think the standard is given to all men. All men will be judged by that standard when they stand before God. But if anybody's going to be able to receive it, it's those of us who know Christ. Those of us who have His indwelling spirit. Those of us who understand the forgiveness that was given to us. And should work through the issues that come up in marriage. Again, if anybody on the planet is able to receive it, it's those of us who know Christ. The idea of marriage and divorce is, and remarriage is obviously a, 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 one of those as I said, one of those cultural issues, one of those difficult issues because of how it affects all of us. The idea is, is trying to get into the Bible and see the truth that is there. And understanding what, what we need to be able to follow Him, it is the Lord who gives the strength through that. It's not, not, not on our own. It was the first institution given by God. There's a greatness to that relationship that we can't lose sight of. It's in that context that it will last. It's in that context that it will last. Now, of course, this message, let me say this right now. I know we have visitors here, even for members that are here. This certainly was, was of course, the truth applies to all, but I'm speaking to, to our church. But maybe you're here right now, you're not even sure if you're to die right now where you would go. 
You don't know what would take place. If you were to die right now, would you go heaven or hell? Listen, please understand this as we go into this time of invitation. Listen to my words carefully. One day you already know this. You are going to die. You don't know when that is, but that's going to take place. Death will find you. It is appointed unto men once to die, the Bible says. That day will come. And that verse goes on to say, but after this is the judgment. So you will be judged of Almighty God after you die. Judgment day is coming. That will take place. You will stand before God. He will judge you. And you're in a really bad spot. All of us are. Because we know when judgment hits, according to Revelation 20 and 21, all who are found guilty are cast into the lake of fire. Every single one. And all of us are guilty. There's nobody in here who meets God's standard of perfection. Nobody. Something has to take place where it looks like you are perfect. That's God's requirement. Not that you join our church and everything's good to go and, 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 you, and you turn over a new leaf. God's requirement is perfection. But none of us are. And the Lord knew that. He knew again where we were. And through grace, mercy, and love, what he did was he sent his son to become a man. To live on this earth a perfect life. So finally, there would be a man who lived on this earth that can go to that judgment. And the father could say, you're innocent. I find no fault. Understand, he lived that perfect life for you. And that, that wasn't even enough yet, though. Because God is just. Sin has to be dealt with. It's who he is. He just can't say, it's all right, I, I, I'm just going to forget about your sin. He can't do that. He's just. There's nothing just in that. You are believing a lie if you think that's going to, how that's going to work when you die. Justice has to be met. And that's where the cross comes in. That was Christ taking your sin upon himself and the Father judging him for your sin. And after three days and three nights, hell did not hold him because he was also God. He rose again from the dead. He lived a perfect life in your place that you could have his righteousness. And then he died on the cross that he could take your sin. Salvation is only in what Christ did. The only way you escape that judgment is through what Jesus Christ did. And that is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. If you will come to him, he absolutely will save you. With heads bowed.